Um, <clears throat> Robert is a Seattle-based collector. He's acquired about 12,000 American snapshot photographs from the, 19th, oops, back up, okay, from the 19th century through the late 1980s. Uh, his images are purchased from dealers, exchanged from <coughs> collectors, um, or acquired directly. Selections from his collection have been exhibited in galleries and museums throughout the United States. Most notably, the 2007 exhibition, The Art of the American Snapshot, 1888 to 1978, from the collection of Robert E. Jackson at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And here is the stunning catalog from that, from that exhibition. With that on the <laughs> um, We're here today for um, a wonderful little um, conversation um, between Professor Christopher Stein and Robert Jackson, um, a question and answer interview um, format um, to really get into you know, how, why, and all the um, intricacies of his uh, collecting practice. Um, we've invited him here. Uh, Chris and I, Denise Pelletier from the art department, um, as part of our, actually he's our co collector in residence. Um, in our course, our jointly taught two courses um, on secrecy and invisibility. So um, we're here for a couple of reasons. One, because he's uh, been working with our students for a couple of days to help curate um, a group of photographs that he's provided for our students, and we have this wonderful little exhibition out in front of us. So this is a collaborative project between Robert Jackson's um, photographs and this seminar class that Chris and I teach. And um, the students in the course, uh, many of whom, if not all of whom, are here, selected and curated the images to develop a visual narrative focused on the course themes of secrecy, voyeurism, surveillance, and invisibility. So as you look at that exhibition out there, you can see these themes emerge through the organizational strategies and the eyes of the students, as well as um, the raw material presented to them by, um, very generously by um, Robert. Um, a word about our course. Chris's section is called um, Secrecy, Power, Privilege, and the Invisible. My section is called Visioning the Invisible. But really, it's one class co-taught by the two of us. And we have a, a syllabus that we've um, put together to get uh, you know, a co-taught class. But the only difference is, and our students meet together, but the only difference is in the class is that for our large projects, um, to be embarked at midterm, um, Chris's class will um, engage in a research paper um, gleaned from all the subjects that we um, tackle during the course related to the theme. And my students will do visual arts projects. So it's a wonderful place where reading, writing, critical discourse, and um, observation merge with um, visual art practice. So um, I would like to say uh, we would like to thank um, to the generous support of the departments of Art History and Architectural Studies, the Museum Studies Certificate Program, and most significantly, the Endowed Fund for the Visiting Faculty of Contemporary Art to help us bring Robert Jackson here to us. Um, and with that, I would like to give um, the floor to Chris. Yeah, so scholar, resident, collector, resident. 
residents, and I did Google, there is no other collector in residence program out there, so we are <laughs> 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 Uh, so anyway, so welcome, and I hope you enjoyed your residency it's, so it, far. It's been wonderful. I, it, it really was a dream of mine to try to do something like this, because sometimes the collector gets a little bit short script in, in some ways. Um, I, so I thank um, Connecticut College uh, for allowing me to do this. Um, I, I thank uh, Chris and Denise for um, having me come, because they you know, decided this would be a really interesting thing to do. And I really appreciate this. Um, there's a lot of people to thank. I also want to thank Ben, uh, the Librarian of Special Collections, and this library for actually being uh, willing to provide the cases for the, for the show that's outside here, which if you haven't seen afterwards, please go out and see uh, all the hard work that the class and, uh, and the students have done to make this such an exciting and, and sort of intriguing um, uh, photography uh, grouping. To that point, I would like all of the students who worked on this to please stand up. I think. <laughs>
And then I guess you're collecting something that's a sub subcategory of something that is new for the panel. So I guess my question is, you know, where do you see snapshots fitting into the history of art? Do you consider them art and are they part of the canon? Well, you know, it's interesting because that you know there was a little bit of a discussion when we did the, the uh, show at National Gallery because it's called the art of the American snapshot. But actually also art means skill, right? There's the art of painting or whatever. Um, so when you think about it, everybody here is taking photos, right? There are more in the canon of photography, there are more snapshots and anonymous vernacular photos that exist than there are really fine art photography photos that exist. I mean, of the billions and billions of stuff out there, the fine art photography portion is rather small. So in a way, when people think of the snapshot vernacular as the other, while well, everything is the, the, the fine art, really in the, in the sense of in terms of numbers, it's, it's, it's really the, the fine art photography that's the other. This is the, this is the material that is actually more prevalent, more, um, it, it's out there every day. It's the visual wallpaper in which we live our lives. Whether it should be considered art or not, that's another level of, I think that's sort of maybe where the collector comes in to decide if this stuff is something that um, should be looked at a little bit more seriously and it's, it's, it's curated from the, 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 the many, many things that are there. I'm not going to say that it's art. I'm just going to say that it's, it's, it's wonderful imagery that I think uh, in some ways can stand up to the power of a fine art photograph. The issue, of course, is they're much smaller. There's an intimacy to them. And sometimes maybe the, the, that nature of the size can make one think, oh, they just don't have the import or the importance of, of a named photographer. Um, but, um, and, and you know, I always say that vernacular material is not dealing with the, the, the um, dark room and you know the, the, the beauty of the photo, which so much of fine art photography is sort of related to, it's all about the image. And people that collect it, like myself, don't care about any, anything other than the fact that the image excites us. And so there's a saying that uh, a lot of fine art photographers, fine art collectors, buy with their ears, not with their eyes. Because a lot of people say, oh, I've heard this photographer is really important. Their stuff is going, you know, going up in value. That's 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 buying and looking at with your ears. You know, we we look at our eyes and say, wow, this is really really cool. And media see or whatever, we get excited and we want to buy it. And a lot of times, if you learn more about uh, fine art photography, you then when you see a snapshot, you go, oh yeah, this reminds me of an Edelson. This reminds me of an artist, and I really want that. So there's, there, there's always that kind of thing as well. Right. So, so speaking of sort of the relationship between fine art yeah. photography and vernacular, you know, if you look at some street photographers like Helen Levin or Rena Grant uh, or Diane Harvest, there's a sense in which their photographs are almost emulating the snapshot. That's right. And there's, then there's also a sense of kind of voyeurism in their photographs, which we saw in the show right. Right here. So I guess my question was, do you think there's a difference between the kind of voyeurism in the professional photographers who are uh, using voyeurism as part of their practice versus a snapshot, uh, which is a different type well, of voyeurism? Well, um, if voyeurism is, is relationship of the photographer as stranger to subject, then in both cases, I guess you could say that there will be a similarity in terms, I mean, a lot of these photos that are out here they did not know who that person was. Uh, but now when we start to talk about secrecy in, the, in that kind of thing, um, most snapshot people are taking photos of intimate moments of people they do know. And fine art photographers aren't really dealing in that kind of regard. So that the kinds of things that you're going to find in that, in, in that realm is going to be a little bit different than what you're going to see in snapshots. Uh, and so, so going back to the collecting idea, okay. and, you know, so, so Denise mentioned that Robert has a collection now of 12,000 yeah. uh, snapshots beginning 
in 1990, which you began collecting in 1997. And I guess in some fields of collecting, your goal is for completeness. Uh, so, you know, to get the full set of engravings by Ian Blake, or to get the complete set of McDonald's Happy Meal toys. Um, <laughs> or or something. Right, so, so in the case of snapshots, you know, is there a completeness? When do you know you're done? When you don't. <laughs> You know, if you sort of, sort of get a group sometimes together and you say, well, I'm, I'm sort of, I've done it. Partly, you, the way I have to understand collecting is it's a search for visual language to make sense of all of the noise of, 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 of this world of imagery that's out there. Because you're trying to make sense of, 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 of life and of, of this medium. And so I'm always looking for things that seem to tell me something that seems to speak to me that has some sort of visual language that makes sense of an unknowable, unknowable um, uh, sort of life that we live. Um, and so that's continual. Now, sometimes when I'm collecting subjects, I'll just get to the point because I collect, you know, people dying and mass and double exposures and silhouettes and all. Maybe when I get to a certain critical mass, I can maybe say, I think I understand the story. And then maybe I want to move on. Because there's other things that maybe start to pique my interest and I start to move on with it. Like for example, I'm starting to collect this within the last five, six months, images of, of photographs where it's stamped proof on it, proof photos, which would be um, you know studios stuff. It's not necessarily snapshots so much, but you know, it's something that I'm interested in. And I'm still working through finding, it's a discovery of what I can find in that area. And I need people like dealers and eBay and other people to say, hey, this is what I've got. And then I'm like, okay, this helps complete my story of what this is all about. Um, but you know, you sort of never you know, in some, some ways you sort of never get to the, to the end, you know, I mean, yes, I have 12,000, do I really need uh, any more? Maybe not, but you know, I can sort of reshuffle them and look at them, but, but also, um, what one does as a collector is that, I always say it's sort of like a gardener, you're constantly culling through what you have collected as your eye changes, as circumstances change. You say, I don't really like these, <coughs> they don't fit, they're not as good as I think I can get other things, because you know, you, you, you're challenged by the kind of material that is being offered to you to sort of buy up, to buy better. And so, you, you know, you're, you're, it's a, it's a, hopefully it's a constantly enriching um, uh, uh, thing that I'm doing um, to, to get maybe a, to set a little bit better, better material. Yeah. Um, so you, you talk about visual language. Yeah. I love that, that concept. And I've, I haven't seen all 12,000 of your images, but I've seen a lot of both what you put online, right? Publications, as well as what I saw when I was in Seattle, sure. and to me, there, to me, there is sort of a Robert Jackson aesthetic, um, and you know, I'm not sure if we can define that. But, but one question I had is, do you think there are people out there who are emulating your aesthetic and trying to put together collections that are very similar to yours? Right? Mm, I don't know. I would hope not, then they'd be my competitors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I know there was a title on eBay that some dealer who was selling would put by the photo that was for sale, RJ. And I was like, hey, that's R-E-J or something. And I went to that dealer and I'm like, what? Why? Oh, he, he had a reason to stay anyway. I said, don't do that. I don't like that. Stop. Um, I would say that in, some, in a lot of cases, some of the absolute best stuff that is out there to be bought, everybody will buy, guaranteed. Everybody will buy. Whether they're willing to pay the price is another thing. But it, um, you know, because price can become the determinant of whether they want it or not. So there's always that kind of stuff. I mean, so I, that would mean that I'm no different than anybody else. There's going to be obviously stuff that I buy that maybe people aren't as interested. Maybe once they see it, they start to think, well, that's pretty cool. Um, and maybe by the association of it being my collection, they're thinking, well, okay, uh, I, I should maybe want to you know, see it too. I mean, maybe with the proof thing, maybe now people are like, oh, wow, I should be collecting proof photos. 
I would say in terms of my study, one thing I realized, um, and I try to sort of have to be careful, I know that I am a formalist in terms of the kinds of things I'm interested in. In other words, it has to be starkly immediate when I <coughs> see the image. In other words, I can hold it like this far away, and the strength of that photo has an immediacy, and, a, and, a, and, a, and it hits me such that I'm like, yes, I want that. I'm not a kind of person who wants to what I would call read a photo, where you would have to read it up very carefully and, and do that kind of stuff. But I have been influenced by other people and what they collect to start to think yes, because when I see a body of work like that, I'm like, well, this actually is pretty cool, and maybe I need to start going down that way. So it's sort of a two-way thing. I see stuff and I start emulating them, and they may see stuff of mine and start emulating me as well. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about sort of thinking of the future of collecting, yeah. and you know, as you know, the digital age comes in in about 2007. Um, and, and you know, is there anything being photographed today that's collectible? You can't really collect it for it. No, you know, uh, there is a show right now up at the Met on um, cell phone photography. It's a, sort of a dialogue between two fine art cell phone artists who did something and they had a presentation. So the people are starting to think about this in terms of ways that the museums can, can talk about it. But in terms of collecting, in that we, uh, all of us, are still so tied to the, to the physical image. I haven't yet made the leap to think, oh, well, you know, what should I try to collect? You know, I, if I see something cool on Instagram that isn't from my collection, I might like it, you know, as one can do, but I haven't thought about taking it and putting it in some file and saying, well, this is something I want to sort of, what I would call collect. Um, I don't know, you know, I, I just don't get how it's going to sort of work um, in terms of what one will do with that. I, I don't know what to say. Besides the medium, you've also commented on how the nature of photography has changed. And you, there's a quote that you somewhere that I found that you said, the snapshot used to be about the we in America, now the snapshot is about the me. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. Um, well, it sort of folds into my thought that um, snapshots used to be about rawness and about immediacy and about something very personal and very intimate because it was done for people that were family and friends, somebody they loved. Most photography now, in a snapshot kind of way that's taken, is not for us that are our media's It's for strangers. It's all about taking photos to impress strangers. So that is completely changed everything. Uh, and because we do that, um, we are trying to, I call it the well-curated life. The Instagram is about that now. It's not about the rawness of, of looking with flaws about ourselves, whatever. It's about showing, uh, uh, trying to invoke envy in our lifestyle. Ergo, it's about me, my food, my life, my clothes cute guy I'm with, whatever, you know. Um, and that sort of changed things. The we meeting, because everything used to be centered on the family when you would get together and say, oh, let's take a picture of us at Christmas or, or at Easter or, or whatever. I, I don't know that so much of that's done anymore. I see all these people, pictures, and it's never, it's just people by themselves, you know, showing off whatever they're doing. You know, their they're, they're, they're new body parts or God knows what else we're trying to impress people with. So that's the way I look at yeah. it. So, so related to that, you know, you, the, in both cases there is sort of a narrative, whether it's a narrative of we or the narrative of me. Um, in anthropology, there's been all this literature on the social life of things and the idea okay. that when things move from one place to another, from one owner to another, the narrative changes. Right. Yeah. So I guess my question is, you know, you've obviously we don't have any way to retrieve the original narrative because we don't know who took the pictures right. out there. So what? So what happens with narrative? Is it, is it okay for visitors to the show to sort of make up their own narrative? Of course, of course. 
I've made up my mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, because when they're unhinged, the snapshot generally, or all really, is about memory. Generally, the reason we take a photo, and probably still do, is to remind ourselves about something, right? Once it goes into another realm, and that memory is not shared by family or friends, being the we, it, it's about something else, we then start to invoke another kind of um, narrative about it. As I said, the narrative today with a lot of Instagram is about envy uh, and, and the enviousness. Um, collectors were looking at it and thinking, oh, it looks like a DNR, it looks like a Gary Winograd, or it reminds me of something in my own childhood. Um, so that becomes the narrative, I guess, that, that happens. Um, and sometimes when I do my pairings, whatever it is, it, it's my narrative. I mean, in some ways, maybe the legacy of my life will be, the, the narrative will be, is I had all these snapshots, and this is what my eye looked like, and this is what it's all about. And maybe that's what those snapshots really, in some way, will represent, because they were just discarded. And I took them and decided that I wanted to do something with them, and they, they become my lives in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so we're using the word snapshot a lot. Maybe yeah. you, do you want to talk a little bit about why they're called snapshots, where that comes from? Oh, well, see, I see, see. I didn't know you were going to do this. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I think it was a term initially used by John Herschel in the 40s, but really what it comes from is it's a hunting term, uh, and I found this pamphlet. Uh, it's sort of the, the sense that what you would do with your rifle is um, that you would take it, you would see something, you would just aim it and shoot. Maybe a little bit like skeet, but skeet's a little bit, you sort of know it's coming, but it's sort of this, rat, this sort of hurrying, this boom, boom. And that kind of thought of shooting is essentially the concept of taking a snapshot. But it really did originate with the gun and with hunting and shooting. Um, and then it just uh, came to be thought of in the vernacular of, of, of people that were um, you know, hunting down something, uh, an image or whatever, and taking a picture of it. So the, so the I think Susan Sontag, Joe talked about snapshots, but she talks about the relationship between the camera and the rifle and the idea that shooting a picture is, you know, has a sense of shooting right. and a gun too, yeah. so there's a parallel there. Both have a round aperture in the way, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. there's visual similarity. Uh, you know, the bear um, right. um, And then people have also talked about collecting as a form of hunting. So, so, so it's sort of interesting that you, you know, that the snapshot is the hunting photograph and then you as the collector is hunting the snapshot. Yeah, you know, that, that's something I, I don't think. People always say, oh, I love the hunt. They gave a lot of enjoyment out looking through all the boxes and looking through the I have said, I really should say this if I'm going to be on this camera, I'm sort of a snapshot diva. I love the fact that somebody says, look what I have found. This is, I think you will love it. This is great. And I think, I'll pay up for it. I didn't have to do any of the work. It's what I want. That person is thoughtful enough to show it to me. That's what I'm really more interested in, you know. I'm not really sort of interested. The process is, I'm not going to say it's not fun, but the process is really not the point. The end is what the point is for me. And that's all I'm really, so I'm very intent on that. And, um, and the least amount of work that I have to do to get to the point of getting that photo is, is really what it's at, you know. Um, so you're, not, you're not digging through the dollar. I don't want to. The dollar photo no. box. <laughs> <laughs> the dollar best
So I guess my question is, what, what do you see the boundary between an artist, a collector, a curator? I mean, do they, are there, I mean, are you an artist of sort of thing? This is my question. Um, people have said that to me. Do I think of myself that way? I, I don't know. Um, I think in the terms of trying to pair things and to think about interesting uh, ways to look at material, and maybe if I'm like buying uh, decayed and things that maybe people wouldn't see, and maybe trying to figure out how to, to pair them with other things. You know, the, the act of, um, you either amass the material, or you try to do something with it such that it um, tells a story um, or evokes some sort of emotive emotion. And I guess in doing that, um, I guess you could say it's sort of an artistic kind of thing. Um, I mean, the only time that I think that in terms of real creativity, I bought negatives. And when you take a negative and you hold it up, the, the, it, it's going to be white, the body or whatever, and everything else is going to be black, right? And then when you turn it into a positive, it's going to be the other way around, right? So what I was interested in was that when I held it up and saw it, just the starkness of the white and the black behind it, I wanted to print it just like that. So I actually digitally printed them large, and they looked like negatives because they were, you know, and I framed them, and I actually had, as it was on the gallery wall, and it actually sold. Now that's sort of an artistic conception that's a little bit different than the kinds of things we're talking about here. But um, you know, if I decide to pair things in certain ways, um, and in some ways doing what we're doing out here is somewhat artistic in its concept of, of people coming up with, with thought process and how they're, they're laid out and, and, and sort of what we're doing. So um, I, I guess that's sort of what I'm really trying to say. Yeah. And so there's the parent, I know we should, you should say a little bit more about the parent. So there, and we don't have the images behind us, but there's one, one wonderful parent that, that, that I've seen is two photographs you have of women, girls that were taken from behind with long hair. Okay. And they're clearly separated by decades, so right. they have nothing to do with each other, but they look almost like identical right. photographs. I think in the catalog, so one of the curators at the National Gallery describes it as photographs separated at birth then come oh, back, yeah. come back together in your collection. Yeah. You know, so how often does that happen that things you know that are almost visually identical but separated by decades and miles? Some it, it happens with some regularity. I don't know about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like making triptychs of stuff that aren't maybe related. I, I play around and share a lot of stuff on Facebook with this kind of material. Uh, it, because it's sort of fun and it's ways for me. And, and, and I mean, maybe this is not going to be an artistic, but I'm always sort of trying to see what something is going to look like once you think you've sort of got it built. And it's always sort of taking different photos and putting them together as a sort of mosaic that sort of, to me, tells some sort of narrative. It might tell more of a narrative about me than it is about the photos themselves. But, you know, it's, it's just sort of the, sort of the way I think of life. Well, we love your Facebook posts. Instagram, you can follow Robert Jackson on both. Um, so the last question I was going to ask just before we open it up is just to talk about upcoming projects. And you, you've got two upcoming projects that you kind of bookend the history of photography, the cabinet card of right. color 4x6. Right. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I am unusual in, 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 the, in the sense that I'm interested in photo history and scholarship. And maybe I'm a frustrated in art history or whatever. But I, when, when I was collecting the snapshot and wanted to do something with it and approached the National Gallery, and they were a little bit nervous about doing something about that. Um, but when we couched it in the fact that, that they decided to tell the history of the snapshot from 1888 to 1978, which is essentially at that point when my collective collection ended. So I'm interested in collecting such that a story, a narrative can be told about a certain medium. And so I was adamant when I, when I had the show at the National Gallery that there had to be a catalog associated with it. 
that could be somewhat of a textbook kind of thing that would sort of tell the story. And, and, and all four curators uh, at, the, at the Department of Photography at then who were there at the National Gallery wrote essays about that. So I did it. I'm great. I keep collecting. But I'm like, OK, where's another area that I can sort of collect where I don't have a lot of competition, where it's not that expensive, and it's been neglected in scholarship? And I said, hey, there's this cabinet card thing. The cabinet card is about the 1970s to the beginning of the 1900s. And nobody has, there is absolutely no book on this subject. And I'm like, well, there you go. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to see what I can get and, and build a collection. It was a little bit more difficult once you get into the 19th century to find an institution who's willing to do a show because it's 19th century and they don't think that the audience for that is as great as anything from the 20th to 21st century. But uh, Amy Carter's decided they're going to do a show. Uh, it will have a catalog. It will tell the story of the snapshot in America. Uh, and it hopefully will happen in the next um, three years. So that's done. All right, essentially done. Uh, and then I'm like, I started collecting four by six. Four by six photos is um, the last kind of paper photo that happened before we went digital in, in 2007. It was about a uh, 25 year period, I guess. Uh, in 1990, which for us old um, toddlers here, not since even that long ago, but 1990s a fourth of a century ago. I think there's something to be said about this. It's an interesting historical period. It's a lot, all kinds of a different aesthetic. I'd like to see a show. I'm working on that. Probably won't have a catalog. It's too new. I can't get anybody probably to, to come up with having uh, uh, the money to do that. We'll see. So those are kinds of things that I'm working on. And so I guess then I could say have a show in the 19th, have a show in the 20th, have a show in the 21st century. And I guess maybe in some ways I guess my, I've done it. I mean, I'm, I'm, sort, of, I'm sort of completed. I, mean, sort of, I don't know. You know. I mean, there's always something else I can work on. But I, I would have felt sort of fulfilled. I mean, I'm fulfilled now, really. Um, but I, I, I'm sort of interested in turning a stone to areas that are neglected in this vast area of photography and shining a light and scholarship on it so that other scholars can build on that. And I don't know that a lot of collectors think that way. But I mean, I guess because I came from fine, um, you know, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, in, in an uh, institution of higher learning, and you know, your students, I mean, you, it, it gets seeped into you, this scholarship and study, and you want to do something. You want to add to the body of, of knowledge in the field. So, um, well, I don't have all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> or all the answers. <laughs> all the, I have all the answers. <laughs> um, so maybe we could open it up to the audience. So. Yes. So, sorry, sort of going off of the last uh, question you just answered, how do you think the art world would be different if photography was considered a serious medium from the start? Well, I, I'm not sh I don't. I think it's considered a si serious medium. It's taken some time for, I mean, you mean from the start, I mean, there was always a, I think it was always sort of, painting, painting and sculpture, it's true, in the 19th century sort of had superseded. Uh, it took time because remember, it was, it, was a, it was an art form that was derived from a machine, a little bit different. It takes time for that to people to get comfortable with that. Uh, uh, now, you know, maybe the question is, what would it have been like a snapshot when they considered an art from the beginning? That would have never happened. It, it, that stuff was too personal. It was just stuff that, you know, you, people kept in their families, and it took time for it to start to come out. Um, so, I guess that's all I have to say. Yes, anybody? Yes? What do you think about the, like, your growing popularity of Polaroids all over again? I love them. <laughs> That's a show. I'd love to do a show on my Polaroids. Um, and then, of course, again, I like to sort of vert it. But most of the time when people think of Polaroids, they think of the color ones that came out on the sheet. There's a lot of really interesting black and white Polaroids. And I thought, hmm, maybe I would like to do something there. Because if people say, is that really a Polaroid? And actually, if you look in the cases here, there's a number of Polaroids you might not know of Polaroids. I mean, you might know because you all, you students have worked with it. But there, there are Polaroids that don't necessarily look like the kinds of Polaroids. Polaroids has been getting more and more of an interest. They just had a show at Amy Carter uh, on what's called the Polaroid Project, where people are talking about. But again, they're talking about Polaroid from the sense 
of the fine art uh, people who take those pictures, not the vernacular. I would like to highlight a little bit more of that, and that would be nice, but gosh, you know, I'm not trying to convince people to do a couple of my show notes, to like something else. But I'm actively buying Polaroids, and I'm buying the ones where they're all messed up in the emulsion, and sometimes those things sell now for more than some of the other stuff. You're going to be very happy tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stacy's my friend, she's a dealer friend, and um, she provided me with a number of things that were in the National Gallery show and it's in the cases. So it's really because of people like like the, that Stacy that we, because she's doing all the hard work, she's calling so that I can and you know she knows what people like and she helps you know it, it, it's a it's a it, there's a, it's it's all all working together. It's you know it's not me. Oh, this wonderful photo you have. Well, yeah, because I got it from Stacy who thought it was wonderful too. You know these things they they build. You know and the dealer that she bought it from thought it was wonderful too. So the stuff is you know it's an enriching wonderful. And everybody, I guarantee that every one of you in your family snapshots has something so amazing and so wonderful that if you know that you should be proud of and herald, herald and hopefully keep. I mean, though I'd like to have it, but you know, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of art, or I mean, we talk about art, or, but there's a lot of really cool stuff that exists in, in everybody's life, and 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 then the, the, the that that narrative that that makes up who we are, and. Hopefully, you don't throw it away. Yes, someone else? Yes. Um, you, had mentioned, um, you had mentioned that the artists, some of the artists of the, let's say, 60s and 70s were influenced by the snapshot aesthetic. That's right. And looking at the vitrine and, and other vernacular, perhaps, collections or shows, there seems to be a prevalence of the surreal. You know, maybe that's a huge, maybe that's, I don't know if that's intrinsic in a naive kind of taking pictures by the population, but I'm just curious, beside, or it could be the way you're curating your own collection, but are there other, perhaps, art movements that the general population has absorbed and put in, take like pop art, for example, or cubism? Do you, when you collect these things, do you say, wow, this was sort of in the, in the air and the vernacular photographers have sort of, or, or, or is that just that fine art is, is of such a different intention that these vernacular photographers, the surrealism just happens to be part of a given, sort of part of the, the, the mistakes of photography and maybe human nature versus uh, cubism was such an elite thing, especially at that time, that there's no, uh, all of a sudden people aren't taking uh, Andy Warhol's, for example, like you're taught. Huh. Uh, okay, I don't really, I'm trying to think how I would answer this question. Um, I think for the collector, being exposed to surrealism, cubism, abstract expressionism, uh, and for the viewers of today, we, we are comfortable looking at things that seem rather odd because our visual history is such that we are comfortable seeing that because we've seen it for so long. Now, whether people who were taking the snapshot people were trying to emulate that, there's always this sort of divide between what's called the amateur photo photographer, who took really cool photos, and the actual snap shooter. And there might be stuff in my collection that the amateur photographer took that was somewhat influenced by some of these movements and visualism. That's a little bit difficult for me to, um, to say. Uh, I'm thinking more in terms of the approaches. I, I don't know. I, I sometimes sort of feed more into popular culture. In the 50s, there were um, three and a half by three and a half photos. Uh, there are some three and a half by three and a half photos. In the, in, in the um, cases, and they have deviled edges. And my theory is that that became popular in the 50s because of TV. The televisions emulated that screen. And so people doing the cameras said, oh, there's visualness on this TV screen. We're going to make cameras that you can take pictures that sort of look like that. And then when you have, um, you know, uh, looking at a movie screen, and you go to a movie theater, and it's rectangular. So then I'm thinking people were saying, well, oh, I don't always have to take my pictures um, vertically. I can actually take a picture horizontally. And maybe that makes more sense. Because really, um, a horizontal picture is more useful for narrative of things. And vertical, a lot of times, is much more straightforward. And it's curious um, that in my 12,000 photos, I would say, I know I don't have a 1,000 that are horizontal. I might have. 600. 
So I, most of my clothes are vertical because that's the photos that most people do. I was just going to add to the, the surrealism point also that, so there's another category of photographs which Robert collects and which I collect, which are people posing in fake airplanes, people posing in fake boats, in fake uh, cars, and these go back to the tin types in the 19th century, right up you know, to, the, to the 1950s. And, you know, I don't think they were taken at to be surrealistic, but I think in hindsight now we see them as surreal. And so one of the search terms, and, you know, when you shop on eBay, search terms are critical. One of the search terms on eBay sometimes is surrealism, and it brings up these kind of photos, which have nothing to do with surrealism, in the sense that we see that as being kind of surreal. And a lot of dealers don't even know what surrealism is. I mean, I probably think some of them don't. And don't even, they just, it's a good key word to bring in me. And you know, whether it is or not surreal, yeah, that's, you know, but yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of crazy. But that's a whole other thing about how eBay stuff is done. But yeah, it's true. It's an overused term. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. Um, as someone who grew up in the era of 4x6, I'm really uh, curious and excited about your new project. Oh, good. And um, I was wondering, um, since, I mean, that era, like 80s, 90s, there's, uh, it's a one format world of photos. Right. Well, if you count 3x5, then two format. But That's what is, right. What difference does it make in your thought process when you curate and try to pair the photos together to plan for a show for versus the uh, one one size working with one size photos versus working with so many different kind of formats of photos? Well, at this point, I've just been collecting. I haven't been thinking about, and I, and I do a little pairing with them. They don't really pair as easily. I'm not sure how low orientation is going to be. I, I want them to stand alone. I don't want them to see them all in sort of whatever. I, I don't know what it's going to. And you'll see some 4 by 6 if you don't. The, the, the gentleman um, that doesn't have, uh, has flowers on his chest, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, that's a 4 by 6 I was really happy to get that. I have a few more of those actually uh, that are in the show because there's no need to have a huge series of those. Um, so, you know, this is still a real emerging area, uh, and I'm not even sure how the any curator who does the show is really going to sort of address this. I think it's really going to be sort of addressed by lifestyle of a certain time period. How they put them together, I don't know at this point. Anybody else? One, I mean, one of the issues that the 4 by 6 brings up is also Kind of the, the ethics of display in photographs that you know the, in the in the cabinet cards you know the person or their relatives very unlikely that they're going to walk into the show oh, four yeah. by six there is that slight chance mm -hmm. that somebody could say that's the guy in the flowers is you know is me uh, yeah you know, so are there ethical considerations well and then, or maybe you should it was legal, it's legal. Uh, I, I don't know I mean I don't try to get involved you know obviously. I didn't steal the photos. They came to me in a certain way. Uh, a lot of times what happens with, you know, people ask me, well, how, how is it that these photos get out there? Well, one way, and I told the class this, was that um, people put things in their storage lockers. Either they forget about it, they run out of money, and they don't pay. And there's photos in there. And then there's the pictures who might buy that photos and take them and then give it to a dealer. And then, and then it goes up the line in terms of so, you know, uh, what can I say? It's out there because, you know, somehow it, it, it's, it just got, at, at that point, that's probably what happened, you know, I'm assuming. Or somebody said, I just have too many photos. It's too, I don't do this anymore. They're all on my, you know, you know JPEGs or my whatever, and then they get rid of them, they sell them. Yeah. So, I, mean, I think it's more, I was thinking, Less in terms of the collector, but more the museum showing them. Well, I, 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 it's, it's, never, come up. it's never seemed to come up. Yeah. And maybe it will. But also, sometimes, I don't know, I mean, the snapshot is still, marketplace wise, doesn't command that much money in terms of what they're worth. And they're not allied with somebody who's become famous yet. So, so because of that, what's the point really of going after those people? 
or going out to the museum for some sort of compensation, you're not going to get anything for it. I mean, you know. So it's, you know, there's still sort of the beauty that we can collect something that, in a way, it doesn't engender a lot of money, thus there isn't a lot of people deciding to sue you for it. Because they're not going to get a lot of money. Uh, but, you know, that could change, I guess. Other questions? You mentioned a storage locker, that that's sometimes... It can. And I think the most famous um, example of a photographer is Vivian um, Meyer, who isn't a snapshotter. I consider her maybe an outsider or an amateur or something like that. But um, I'm just wondering if you ever discovered, like, let's say, a, a trove of pictures <laughs> And, and maybe you reject it because they're, I think what you're doing, you're not really collecting outsider artists, right? These aren't people who you credit their names. These are, these are sort of one-offs, or have you ever collected like, oh wow, I've discovered this, just this person that had a talent and I had 20 of their pictures and I'm just gonna disperse them in my collection. Me, personally, that happened. Sometimes you have to, that's the kind of stuff, sometimes you have to get the flea market and get the stuff, you know, before it gets you. And there are people who found that, Kind of material. I haven't been, you know, and sometimes I'm not really looking for that kind of stuff. If I'm looking for the one image is great, I haven't really been lucky enough to find something. Sometimes in an album you'll find a whole bunch of stuff that's really, really cool as a grouping, and that was might have been taken by one person. Um, but that's somewhat rare in itself, also. I think there's also, I mean, that. And there's also, in, in terms of collectors, you know, I think Robert, Robert just collects for the image, as he said, for the aesthetics, and it's not about the documentation. Uh, whereas in, in my collection, which is not nearly as large as Robert's, I'm obsessed with documentation because <laughs> I'm a museum person. So I have, you know, when I bought it, who I bought it from, how much I paid, um, tracking it all. Robert doesn't track it. Yeah, I know. You know I know. Yeah, I mean, and really, you know, but Chris does is actually better. <laughs> I mean, it is, yeah. But I, I, it's just, you know, it's just a different way of doing things. And I, I just, I guess I, I, I need staff for that. And yeah, I have staff. <laughs> That's my way of looking at it, so yeah. Uh, I have another question. On the, the four by six, to go back to that, uh -huh. I think that's so interesting, something you're working on now. You know, one of the other big differences between the four by six and the earlier photographs is the loss of a white border. Yeah. What, you know, what visually, you know, why, why, does it, why do you think it disappears? How does it change the nature of the snapshot? All right. Well, I don't know why it disappeared, except that it gave more, bleed it off more space for people to have their image on there, and people didn't really care anymore about having that, that border on there. And you know, it started in the 70s. Those, you know, those uh, nearly three and a half by three and a half, and they have a rounded uh, border. But, I mean, rounded edge, but there's no, you know. So it 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 slowly did sort of die out. Um, I guess because people, the aesthetic was that they didn't really need it there anymore for their eyes. And that's one reason I used to be adamant that I don't collect any photos that don't have borders. But you know. I mean, it's been 20 years since I've been collecting, you start to bend the rules and you start not to care. I mean, you know, it's not, they're not, a lot of, I mean, that's not my favorite because I love the borders, but um, now uh, for that 4x6, I know I'm not going to get the border, uh, so I, I just have to go with it as it is, you know. Yeah. So do the 4x6 have the date stamp on the back? That's another thing. Uh, some, some photos have the date stamp. Yeah, I think maybe there's maybe there's some sort of color that I can't. Some, some, some yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which is useful. Or, of course, there's a beauty of people actually writing on it, you know, and telling you what it is. So, I mean, there is some of that. And then there's sometimes those ones that I don't know how to describe it, uh, whether in the photo itself, it's like digitally, it's like this little light that says 114. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's useful. I don't know how, why that is now. How that came about, but to let the people who are going to be doing the show figure all that out. That's what scholarships for. They don't, they don't do the work. So. There, there might be some correlation. I'm just thinking in my mind about the borders of the photographs and the use of little photo corners to hold them into an album. And when when the border disappears, it also is the time when those uh, plastic pages come out. Oh, God. Uh, yes, so yes, so yes, yes. Slide into yeah. the pockets. Yeah. Yeah. And you have the borderless. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess. Oh, those awful. <laughs> 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 
I take them out and I immediately I take that stuff out because that stuff is, is toxic. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't talk. I just don't like it. And, and it'll damage folks over time. You know, and, and please never put a post it on a physical photo because it will damage your phone if you think, oh, well, I didn't post it. It's no good. Yeah, um, are the photos that we have in the cases that we've been working with representative of the collection as a whole, or oh. are there ways that they're not? Okay. Um, there's not a lot of humor. I, people say that a lot of my material is humorous and quirky in that way. And this show, maybe you can say there's some humor, but you know, it's a pretty dark show. So it's not <laughs> at maybe some of the kinds of things I have collected, and it's not getting, it's not really dealing with photo processes or what I call photo mistakes. Like I love a lot of the emulsion issues and that kind of stuff because that and, and that becomes the subject of the photo for me. So none of that's being addressed as well, and uh, you know it's not really sort of dealing with what I call the beautiful photo. And a lot of times I'm, I buy faces or, or photos because the beauty of the photo is so wonderful to me. Um, and this is sort of really not what's happening here. So it is a subset, but it's a pretty big subset of what I really love because there are some stuff with the scratching and the, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'd say it's 60% of my aesthetic is probably my outfit. <laughs> one, you know, one, of the, one of the things that's in the exhibition, which you have other examples of, which, you, which we haven't talked about, is when, when, the, when, the, when you find the photograph still on the black paper oh. from the scrap from the scrap album yeah. and there's writing. Oh yeah. So that you know, that changes the whole nature it of does. the relationship. Oh yeah, it's great. You know, so we have you know, the one the woman shot from behind and oh, says yeah. guess who? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah that's great. Woman <laughs> hiding under the bed, all this hiding area. Right. So. Which is I mean that's a it's a perfect demarcation of what you get with uh, with with vernacular and, and, and snapshots and versus what you find in fine art photography. It's just, it's just a whole different thing. I mean, there's a much more of a comfort level with doing that, with riding on the back. And, and there's people that actually uh, take their, um, the, uh, kiss them with their lipstick so that you look on the back and there's this lipstick, or sometimes even on the front. I mean, this is, there's a great amount of freedom with vernacular. And I think that's what I love about it. There's so much, there's so many crazy things that people do. Uh, and it seems more real to me and, and richer than um, the kinds of things I see in fine art. Uh, I mean, I'm not discouraging you, obviously, it, it, you know, fine art, I mean, I love looking at fine art photography, and I buy fine art photography, but, you know, it's just a different kind of thing. And uh, I guess, for me, because I have a lot of money, I love going to shows and, and, and whatever, and looking at fine art photography, and dreaming that maybe I can own some of it, but a lot of times I can't. So I'll just stick with my little area over here Look at it, no, but it's more, it's 
much more rare in snapshot than it is in sort of ninth, other 19th century games, like 10 types of cabin cards, which I have bought a fake cabin card and, and that kind of stuff. But, uh, uh, but it's just the tonality will tell you right off. Would you be interested in doing a show and plagiarize their forged photos um, slash secondhand <laughs> stuff? Because even that in itself would be an interesting concept. Well, no, I don't want to be associated with it actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're out there. Right? So I'm, the snapshots was my question. But I know the earlier stuff is out there. And one of the strange experiences I had when I was putting together the postcard show of Lime Allen, which is real photo postcards, which was sort of you know, 1900 to 1930 or 40, is there was someone was selling unexposed photo the postcard paper. And you wanted a lot of money for it. And I wanted to use it as a display item in the case to show visitors what this looked like. And so I emailed him and I said, well, why are you charging so much money for this 10 sheets of unexposed postcard paper? And he said, well, if I don't sell it to you, I'm going to print, I'm going to print old postcards on these and sell it as, as old oh. postcards. Oh. <laughs> so I bought it. So that's why I got it off the market. Now that's not to say in the snapshot world that there cannot be two photos, duplicates, or three or four. Because remember, these photos were based on negatives. And you can take negatives and make all kinds of And so in the 50s, if they took negatives and took made a bunch of photos of something cool and sent it to all their family and friends, it's, it's, it's conceivable and you can see two of them. But it doesn't mean that they were fake or you know, whatever. It just meant there's more out there than you thought. Yeah. All right, I think we've covered it all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so please look at the show, ask the students are here, they can answer any questions about what they, why they did what we did or how they put it together. And we have, there's a reception outside, I don't know if it's set up yet, but I think it should be shortly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.